Hello and welcome to the lobby, GameSpot's weekly hangout every Tuesday at 2 p.m. specifically Pacific, right here on GameSpot.com. I'm your host, Danny Dwyer. How you doing, folks? What's going on? Video games are happening. Justin Haywall's here, Alexa Ray Korea is here, but we're going to talk, first of all, not necessarily about video games, kind of about video games, kind of about Star Wars, kind of about Disney. What the hell's going on? D23 <laughs> was on over the weekend. My Twitter feed was just like <laughs> a bunch of weird shit <laughs> all happening at the same time. Yeah, I was at D23. It's like the biannual Disney Expo, and because we have a lot of Marvel and Star Wars things happening mm. this year, there was a big Star Wars exhibit, big Marvel exhibits, a lot of news came out of that. We saw trailers for Doctor Strange, and which hasn't started filming yet, but we have footage. Right. And then Captain America <laughs> Civil War. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, Strange, Doctor yeah. Strange. It's still, um, it's still hard for me to wrap my head around that <laughs> Disney isn't, Disney, it's not just the house of the mouse, it's the house of Star Wars and the house of Marvel and like, mm. so when are they just going to buy Nintendo and... <laughs> That's next, probably. Yeah. So let's start, we'll dive into all the different bits and bobs that you saw when you were there uh, in a second, but like, what, to Justin's point, what's the vibe like there? Because we go to something like E3 and it's like, oh, we're all here for video games. Or you go to like, you know, Comic-Con, it's kind of like, oh, we're all here for like comics and kind of movies as well. Mm -hmm. Whereas this is like, there's so many pies it's touching. It's like everything from toys to life, video games to like, Star Wars stuff to like crazy vintage Disney stuff. Oh, yeah. Like, what, what's it like there? So, number one, the bar to get in is very high. The tickets right. are like $200 or oh, something. Wow. And they're, it's a three day event. Um, it was, it smelled wonderful. <laughs> and it That's was, different. it was not crowded. Like, mm. I, so they had on display uh, the new Stormtroopers uh, from The Force Awakens. They had Captain Phasma's armor set up, <laughs> like, for you, and then they had, like, a display with Rey and Finn's costumes and one of the BB-8 props. Cool. That's a little ball thing, right? Oh, no, he's this big. Oh, right, really? He's, like, this Wait, he's big! <laughs> was he moved, was like, the... did you get to see him move? Like, his, he's a practical effect that he yeah. actually moves around on scene. Did you get to, like, see him in action? I didn't get to see him move, but I touched him and someone yelled at me, and when, <laughs> and when he turned around, I touched him again. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Great. Um, but, uh, the... Give it a kick. <laughs> rolling away. Um, the exhibits were roped off, but you could get right up to the edge of that exhibit. Yeah. Like, it wasn't crowded. People weren't, like, smashed around it. It was just people taking wow. photos, moving on. How, how many people were at it? What did it feel like? Oh, my God. I know it's hard to tell, you know. Uh, on a scale of, like, one to San Diego Comic-Con, yeah. it was maybe, like, a four. Like, oh, it was wow. not crowded okay. at all. There was space. Like, I was never caught in a crowd. There's a lot of room to move. Did you have to queue um, up for stuff? Like, get in line? Yes. Yeah. There were, a, there were, like, there were lines to buy things. Like they really? had okay. two Disney specific stores with exclusive merchandise and art right. and stuff. And the lines for those are maybe like an hour long. All the collectors are going to be... Disney has that down oh, to yeah. a science. I mean, not just with the, the number of races that they do that, that sell out almost immediately now mm -hmm. every year, but all the, the different pens, now all the merchandise related to Star so Wars. So many and pens. Pens, t-shirt, people, people line up, they will go to these events just to get a pen, just to get this yeah. special yeah. t-shirt that says, I was at Disney at Star Wars on 2014, August 14th, and then they'll you know, do a different <laughs> shirt for the next day. Yep. And they're so good at, like, like, this is in a bizarre way, like logistics. Mm -hmm. Like one of the best things about going to Disney World is like going to the car park and seeing like, how well they, <laughs> just how well they have that down to a science. And, and yeah. everyone's so happy to work there. Like, even the mm. people who's just like, I'm going to give you a hot dog. He's smiling. Yeah. So I'm happy to the be at Disney. The people there were so nice. The, the, the attendants, there were shops set up, and there were people, you know, enforcers or whatever, mm. and everyone was just so nice. I'd get bumped, and people would be like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, some of the best cosplay I've ever seen. Like, it was just, the whole vibe was just magical and awesome. There were a lot of kids. Mm. The kids were all well-behaved. Family, well friendly, kind of, yeah. Yeah, it's a very, very friendly, uh, family-friendly convention. Their big exhibit this year was, uh, they were previewing the av new Avatar films. They had, like, wow, an experience. Really? God, yeah. Like, I totally <laughs> forgot. Like, yeah, right? they also own Avatar. <laughs> sure, yeah. Avatar. And then they had a big setup uh, detailing <laughs> the building plans for Disneyland Shanghai, oh. which looks like it's going to be, it's going to be so, they have a whole Tron ride with the light cycles and everything that they're building. Can you ride them? Yeah, like oh, I, th I think that's what it is. And then there's uh, cool. like a Toy Story themed hotel. Will it be like... as good as the knockoff World of Warcraft uh, <laughs> theme park that's in China? Have you ever seen that? What? It's awful. Yeah, there's a, a fake, fake World of Warcraft. Like that, it, it's a total ripoff. It is a World of Warcraft theme park, but not official in Everything any way. Everything but name. Where is it? It's in somewhere it's, in China. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we should go. Pretty weird. We so should. We should go. That, that'd be a pretty good. I was. I used to be so video. cynical about Disney and the things they did, especially when I was younger. But now, mm. like as I get older, I'm more. I like. I found it even more endearing, and I'm like, I love going to Disney now. It's like it Disney. is literally a magical experience. It did is. you see uh, Angelina Jolie while you were there? No, I didn't. But I was about ten feet away from Daisy Ridley and John Boyega, who oh, cool. play Ray and Finn in the new Star Wars movie. I saw them on the stage for. Uh, 
uh, Disney Infinity, uh, yes. which has a new um, Force Awakens, Force Awakens set. set. Yeah, tell yeah. us about that. They're doing. A, they only showed a brief clip. They showed uh, Ray and Finn. I love. Uh, I was talking to John Vignocchi, yes. who's Mr. Infinity, and he said that uh, they showed Daisy Ridley her um, her figure, and she just like was so ecstatic. And she, the one thing that she said was, "Oh, you got my shoulders right." Like oh, they wow. do, they do those figures so well, and they look exactly like them. But they have the Force Awakens playset. Um, I did get a chance to play the Rise Against the Empire and Twilight of the Republic. I think it's I think they're called mm. the two uh, the prequel trilogy and the original Star Wars trilogy sets, um, and. I have high hopes for the Force Awakens set from what I played. Like, they're a lot of fun. It's very much wish fulfillment. Mm. I drove the Millennium Falcon into the Death Star and blew, and, and blew it <laughs> really? up. And there was like this sequence where you have to maneuver to get out and there's explosions and everything. Um, it's the only game, there are the figures right now. Sweet. Um, this is the only game where you can beat up Darth Maul with Olaf the Snowman, <laughs> um, which kind of is something that i Is that I'm, one of Johnny's lines? No, that's no, one of mine. That's, really that's good. I'm, I'm right. like really, 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 really <laughs> looking forward to playing it. Um, and I like it. And I've played, you know, some of Battlefront at events and whatnot. But what I love mm. about Disney Infinity is it's just like that sense of wonder and that sense of like you can do anything. I played as Boba Fett and took down an at, -AT and you can just <laughs> do whatever you want. It's great. That's I love a, it. That's excellent. Uh, yeah. Any other last little bits and bobs that you liked to, to mention from? Uh, we'll get to Kingdom Hearts in a yeah. second. But uh, aside from that, any other little bits and bobs you saw that like kind of stuck out to you? Things, things you liked about D23 that you'd probably like to see in like say video game uh, shows that we get to go to all the time. It was so well organized and people were so just positive and everyone was just kind like mm. I'd really like uh, uh, I don't know I'd love to see these events where everyone is I, f I feel like everyone at D23 like there was this big uh, Disney, Disney interactive panel uh, right on Sunday morning and everyone got like this exclusive like Kingdom Hearts Mickey costume mm. for Disney Infinity and of course a lot of people go to that panel just to get like the exclusive thing and like the free stuff or whatever but everyone who was there like the energy in the room and the energy when we were leaving and sort of that whole mess of cons when mm. you're getting in and out of big rooms, everyone was just really respectful and really happy and everyone was there because they wanted to be there and no one was really like crappy. Yeah. And I would love to see that everywhere. Do you know what that actually reminds me of is when we went to BlizzCon last mm -hmm. year. It was like I was blown away by how it felt totally different to a Gamescom or an E3. Well, E3 is kind of a zombies. Mm -hmm. And even a PAX where like people were kind of rushing around to see everything at PAX. And at Gamescom, it's very much like a get in early, try and see mm -hmm. as much as you can, get to the lines quick. Whereas when we went to BlizzCon, it felt like it was just like a party. Everyone got to go to the talks they wanted to go to. And then the yep. lines weren't that long either. Well, it, it's also helped by not having a, t a ton of different things. I mean, BlizzCon is going to be a very focused event on Blizzard right. games. Yeah. And Disney, even as much as there is so many different things, mm. there, there's enough for everybody to see all of these. Mm. And there were some announcements. We got to see the new console and things like that. But otherwise, yeah. <laughs> like you get to, everyone gets to be a part of those things. Whereas in an E3 or a PAX, like this is your first chance to see a lot of stuff. Mm. And so, yeah, you're going to be in, in a rush because otherwise you're going to be in line for four hours. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, speaking of big collaborative exercises at D23, we also saw uh, some, king well, I'm not sure how much we saw, but we saw... Uh, that Kingdom Something. Hearts 3 is going to be set in... Big Hero 6. Bit, yeah, There's a world. San Fran, Tokyo. San, San, San Fran, Tokyo. It's so cute. I can never get that right. Yeah. I, yeah, I feel, I, I got, yeah, I feel like a shell for Disney. But, oh, yeah, no, San Fran, Tokyo. Don't you know all about Big Hero 6? <laughs> no, you know. It's such a cute, such a cute movie. Um, it's, uh, that was, being in that room was phenomenal. They opened the show with Kingdom Hearts. Something about Kingdom Hearts and Disney. Disney... For the past like ten years, and Kingdom Hearts is ten years old. We're just getting wow, crazy. we're so old. I know. Uh, when is I Disney was... just gonna buy Square Enix now? Like, <laughs> so that, you know what? Like, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> could work. Yeah. Um, Disney Interactive actually gets the final say for all of Kingdom Hearts three, which is. Weird, because Disney never really acknowledged, like, Kingdom Hearts was kind of like the red-headed stepchild that they gave yeah. away upon birth and sent it to the, to the orphanage or whatever. Um, because they didn't really, they're like, oh, it's a thing using our properties. We're not really, it's not really a thing we talk yeah, about. Yeah, um, not comfortable, but it kind of, they always no, felt like, yeah. Yeah, I had friends who uh, would visit, visited Disneyland, Disney World in the past, cosplayed as Kingdom Hearts characters and got kicked out of the park because they were like, that's, uh, you can't see, you oh can't here. Oh my God. Like, there was this weird, like, Disney's relationship with Kingdom Hearts has always been like, yeah, we ex it exists and we're just not going to talk about it. Yeah. Disney has, with Kingdom Hearts, 110% embraced it. And like now that, I think now they're acknowledging, okay, Kingdom Hearts is super popular. It's reinvigorating our properties. And what game can you friggin' fight alongside Goofy and Donald? And like <laughs> Mickey is this like benevolent Arthurian king of the universe. Like yeah. it's too good. So now that they've embraced it, um, they announced that 
Uh, the ultimate unlock for Disney Infinity 3.0 is a Keyblade weapon, so mm. you can play with a Keyblade. And then there's that uh, exclusive Mickey costume coming out. Um, oh no, it was exclusive to D23. Only 5,000 were made. I oh. got one. I'm so excited. <laughs> um, but then Kingdom Hearts 3, they they didn't show any footage, mm. but just the announcement itself of coming out on stage and saying Kingdom Hearts 3 is going to feature a world from Big Hero 6. Mm. The crowd went nuts, and then they showed um, a piece of concept art, which is, I'm, I don't want to spoil Big Hero 6, so I'm not going to say anything about right, it. You can okay, Google yeah, it. Yeah. Because, um, as they explained, the events of the world, of the Big Hero 6 world in Kingdom Hearts, are taking place post the film. Oh, wow, okay. Which is interesting because most uh, Kingdom Hearts worlds uh, in previous games, you, uh, you as Sora or whoever you are playing as enters the world, and the world state is within the realm of the movie. So, right, for yes. example, you enter the Cinderella world and you are, it's an escort mission to get her to the, bo to get her to the ball. It's yeah. like, it's, it's, it's stuff like that. So it's odd seeing that they're doing a post-movie world state, and I wonder if mm. If, if that's what Kingdom Hearts is going to be, it's like everything is settled and now we're sort of picking up the pieces of everything that is uh, that has fallen into place. If that's if they're really wrapping that in that way. Imagine, like, oh, good. So, well, I hope you're only going to say the same thing as me, but I was oh. like, Enter the Matrix came to mind. Where, like, imagine <laughs> if they use this, maybe not the most flattering comparison, but if they use this as like a through line to a sequel mm -hmm. to Big Hero 6? What well, were you thinking? No, no, and I was also going to say, like, you mentioned picking up the pieces of a shattered world, which is also what Kingdom Hearts is yep. with all Literally. those terrible games. <laughs> like, ugh. Birth by Sleep 256. No, 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 no. <laughs> Birth by Sleep was great. <laughs> Uh, in order of best games, it's Kingdom Hearts 2, Birth by Sleep, literally everything else with Kingdom Hearts 3D at the bottom, because that game was garbage. Uh, <laughs> do we know what other worlds are going to be in Kingdom Hearts 2? What have they announced over the past, like, since they've talked mm, about it? They announced Tangled at E3, mm, yeah. and Hercules was revealed through, um, oh, that's through a, a weapon. Gosh. That, is, is that even Hercules? relevant anymore? Yeah, yeah. Hercules never feel. Is that even relevant? Well, like, Hercules is always relevant. It's not relevant. the Lion King. It's like, do kids today? Like, they're they're I guess... still going to have Cinderella. They're, they yeah. have the mainstays, Little Mermaid. Mm -hmm. like... Hades is a Hades is a very funny, charismatic villain, and I have to imagine that they keep him around for doing stuff like that. Mm. You got to have good characters, good stuff. Uh, the Hercules world has been in every Kingdom Hearts game to date. You fight in the Colosseum, you do whatever. So mm. I'm assuming that that's going to be there. Uh, Tangled. I'm hoping. I know that they've said that they're not going to do Frozen, but they'd mm. be dumb to not include Frozen. Would they do? Star Wars. So, I've heard things from different people, and because Star Wars and Marvel, well, Star, I, I heard that Star Wars and Marvel, Marvel are not true Disney properties, so okay. they might not use them. However, Big Hero Six is a Marvel property. I think at this right. point, not including a Star Wars world would be totally foolish. I just want to see Mickey Mouse come out with the friggin' lightsaber, mm. the lightsaber Keyblade, or whatever. It's yeah, like a match made in Goofy's heaven. Goofy's head off. That's what we all want to see. <laughs> no. Goofy's Make it so happen, good. Disney. What is, what is <laughs> happening over at Disney Interactive? Because like between everything they've done with the Toys to Life stuff, between like opening up things like Kingdom Hearts, I think about what happened with like the Grim Fandango remake, where like mm -hmm. they couldn't do that with Lucas, and then suddenly like it's happening. Like suddenly Double Fine have like the rights to they just allowed them to do it. Like mm -hmm. there's a big shift happening in their games department for the past couple of years. And that shift is how can we make money? <laughs> oh yeah, no, it's definitely, definitely revenue driven, but it's they're, they're embracing all of the, like by, by taking in Star Wars and taking in Marvel and then sort of acknowledging that Kingdom Hearts is this big thing, I think Disney is saying, hey, we're listening to you and we know you want this stuff, so we're gonna like give it to you mm. and we're gonna support it. Um, their Kingdom Hearts announcement, they had Baymax come out on stage. <laughs> like the door was too small, so he like squished out <laughs> and he like did the pound thing with yeah. the president of Square Enix and they're standing on stage and it's like they're talking about how they're, 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 they're so excited to be working with it, uh, working on the game and everything. And I think Disney is really embracing that interactive element. Like we've got Battlefront and we have the yeah. Battle Pod, which is the thing. And Disney Infinity, they are pouring so much resources into so many resources into yeah, Disney Infinity. Yeah. I'm so excited. We've talked a lot oh. about Disney, uh, so <laughs> we'll, we'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Alex Ray Korea. Justin, yeah, thank you. Uh, more Disney news right here on GameSpot.com. Uh, but for a moment, we're going to take a little bit of a break. I didn't even know. Mary put this on the running order. I had no fucking idea. Apparently, they dug up Gary Jules and there's a new uh, <laughs> mad world. I don't know. Whatever happened to Gary what? Jules? Who knows? Uh, there's a new. Uh, See, so you don't even know what I'm talking about. You're like, who, who dug the, up Gary Jules? Yeah, who the hell's so Gary Jules? Dug up Gary Jules. Uh, He's mad not world. Dead. Gears of War. Ring a bell. Here it is in HD or 1080, 60. I don't know. Worn out faces Hide my hair
yet I want to drown my sorrow No tomorrow, no tomorrow And I find it kind of funny, I find it kind of sad The dreams in which I'm dying are the best I've ever had I find it hard to tell you, I find it hard to take when people run in circles, it's a very, very mad, mad world. Get the Xbox One bundle, now three forty nine. dollars Rainbow Six Siege has been delayed. December 1st, 2015 is the new release date, the same day as Just Cause 3. Uh, curiously enough, uh, and I've got Mike Mahardy and Aaron Sampson here to chat a little bit about the disappointment of Rainbow Six Siege being bumped a couple of months, uh, and also about betas in general, and i got a lot of thoughts about that yourself, Aaron. First of all, Mike, uh, details on this bad boy, it's been pushed three months. Uh, surprised at all? Uh, a little bit. I mean, the I mean the beta, The good thing is the beta is still, what, September, to mid-September? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the, the beta is still the same date, so okay. you're still going to be able to get your hands on the closed beta. They've been throwing keys away like nobody's business. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like you're you're gonna be able to play this game. It it has, hasn't been delayed that much. Mm. Let's, yeah, it's supposed to come out yeah. in October. It's been pushed back to December. It's not so bad. And it's interesting yeah. to talk about the beta because this is a game that like has been really been baited for like a year now. Like it's yeah. been there's been a couple of them and I remember keep going back and new stuff being added and being tweaked a lot. Yeah, I mean games go into betas for I mean, for, when they go into betas for the right reason, it's for balance. That's mm. what they always claim when they delay is, uh, well, we get we need time to like actually dig through our play tests and fix the games. There's a couple of games. It's interesting. Like a, a good case study was Battlefield Hardline. Yes, did yeah. too many betas. Yeah, right so, after like, E3 when they announced it. Like I think that weekend. Yeah, they had the first beta and then they fundamentally scrapped that almost that entire mode. They just kind of rejigged everything from there. You think it had too many, though, throughout its life? Yeah, like, betas are kind of an art form. If you give away too much of your game, then when it launches, people might have already played your game. Mm. You know, I mean, some games, like even Destiny, when it originally launched, I think you'd played about a fifth of the content yeah. Right, yeah. by the time it launched because of the beta was on one of the, I don't know, like four or five planets. Also, yep. you could argue with all the changes they've made that this past year has been a beta. Yeah. So it's interesting. <laughs> uh, betas are something that developers can use if they use them right and mm. they use their delays right, you end up with a better game. If they use them wrong, you've already burned out your audience before you launch your title. I'm also curious because didn't they kind of say that the reason for the beta was to largely work on the co-op, like the extra specific co-op modes? What, what oh, would really? that be, the terrorist hunt? Yeah, Terrorist Hunt was a highly requested mode by the fans. I, I think a lot of people who, you know, played Vegas and some of the other titles, they like multiplayer. Mm. Not everybody loves multiplayer just because, you know, it's one life, you get hit and you're out, and you yeah. got to sit there and watch, a, watch your friends finish every match. Mm. So having that co-op is important because it lets you stay alive longer, do more with your friends. We played it at E3, and it was actually very good. Uh, challenging, mm. which I thought was cool. Yeah. Like we played on the higher level mode, or the higher difficulty modes, and the AI was quite good. And your team communication had to be good, so a lot of the, the strategies were the same. So it's a more accessible, Terrorist Hunt is like a more accessible version of the multiplayer. Mm. Which I'm curious why, after like having so many people played Siege already, I'm wondering why they pushed it back again. I wonder what actually was the impetus for that final decision? Yeah, was there, because I've played a little bit of it. Aaron, I know you've played a lot more. Are there any standout sort of parts of Rainbow Six Siege that you think required addressing? Was there like a lack of modes, a lack of maps, or was there, was there like gameplay stuff that you think actually did need a lot of TLC? One of the things that they could get a little handicapped on is the fact they only showed 10 of their 20 classes. Right. So, you know, the... Maybe people got really good with the first 10. One of them, you know, including Pulse, who could see through walls, he was a little overpowered, so they tweaked his ability. But then, you know, you're going to launch the game, there's going to be another 10 players, yeah. and any of them could break the game. I mean, you know, they showed a medic class recently who can fire revival darts. Mm. There's any number of 
things that a new class member can do to mess with the game. So, do do you think like developers are maybe getting a little bit gun shy in terms of releasing games that are like imbalanced? Like I was talking to the Overwatch guys at Gamescom, and they've basically used every event, be it BlizzCon or PAX, uh, even E3 and, and and Gamescom as well, as like ways of basically like doing A-B testing and like, you know, alpha testing or beta testing their game there. Do you think like people are a little bit reticent of releasing games that aren't like perfectly polishedly balanced? Yeah, especially in light of the last couple of years especially with so many games you could name, I can name like three off the top of my head that mm. had pretty poor release uh, states. You know, like there's Battlefield Hardline like you mentioned, then there's Assassin's Creed Unity which isn't as mm. multiplayer focused but it's kind of if they're upfront about it and say this is going to be our beta, this is our release, I'm f I'm fine with what Ubisoft's doing with uh, Siege, just because, I mean, again, if it's it's not that much of a delay, but it's still a delay. But if it's not going to be like another four months, like mm. at least it's this calendar year. Yeah, like Eve's Gilmon came out. I think it was around E3, saying like this was going to be the biggest FPS Ubisoft have ever made. Yeah, they wanted to outsell Far Cry 4. They're obviously like wanting this to be like a big esporty, like a G like a Counter Strike Go level kind of. Uh, of, of people playing it. You uh, always have to be a little careful though as a journalist when it comes to those sorts of ambitious yeah, yeah. statements. That's the kind of thing that your audience will tell you if you have. If you're telling your audience that's what it's gonna be, yeah. that may or may not happen. Does and it feel like that to you? You're somebody who plays uh, massive amounts of like online first person shooters, specifically like military tactical ones. Does it Siege feel like that type of breakthrough game? Rainbow Six Siege, I, I personally love the tactical combat. I like the change of pace, but it's gonna have to prove that it's not like Evolve, which was yes. really good at doing one thing, but ended up, a lot of people felt just being a one trick pony. Mm. And if you didn't like that pony, like, <laughs> <laughs> then the game had nothing for yeah. you, right? And it turns out after, it seemed like anyway in the months after Evolve's release that not enough people did like that pony. And the, the fall off was, like that hurts the game so much more when there's not enough yeah. people playing it. Like you need that critical mass, right? So yeah, Siege is gonna have to prove that it's a more versatile game if they want it to be competitive with Far Cry. I mean, you know, you're not gonna be popping a wingsuit and like, Flying 200 <laughs> feet down a canyon and then stabbing an elephant to death with, you know, a shovel. That's Unless just that's never going to happen. And what they delayed it for. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I guess I'll have to wait and find out. Uh, Aaron and Mike, thank you so much for coming on, uh, talking all about Rainbow Six Siege, which will be out, like I said, first day of December, right before Christmas. Um, that is, if you're not playing Just Cause 3 that day. Uh, we're going to be back in a second talking about Call of Duty Black Ops 3. I think I tweeted it was Black Ops 2 earlier, uh, accidentally. There's so many Call of Duty games. 2.5. Uh, what, 2.5? 2. 2. Well, the beta right now. Is that what it sounds like? We call the beta 2.5. Ooh, early snip uh, from Mahardi. Uh, we'll be back in a second, though, first of all. <laughs> early snip, I don't even think that's a thing. Uh, Tales from the Borderlands. Did you get a new trailer for that bad boy? Rated M for Mature. So, where's the last piece, little one? Stop it! Please! It's there. I can't think of a better crew than a pair of Pandoran con artists and a Hyperion stooge to figure out a way to get it for me. You don't get that beacon. You're all as good as dead. <laughs> Let's get to work. reason why you think we could possibly break in. You think old Jack would leave his meat buddy hanging? Oh no. But say, we shared the power I had when I sat in this room. What would you do with it? I was wired ready! It's that time of year again, folks. Call of Duty season. Mike McHardy and Aaron Sampson are here to tell us all about the Black Ops 3 beta, which uh, we got a kind of a like 24 hours early access on. I know. 48, 48 maybe? 48. Eric Teano spent last night basically leveling up to... Too long. To, yeah. Uh, all night. Well, he got to level 28, was it? Yeah, we're not sure if that's the cap yet, but that's 
like the soft cap. That's his cap. Him. Yeah. That's his, when he his, falls asleep. His goal was to unlock the killer bee swarm. Okay. He got there. Which he did. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Killer uh, bees. We'll talk about killer bees in just a second. Who doesn't like talking about that? Uh, first of all, Mike, the specialist. This is a sort of a new aspect to the series. Um, tell us about the characters that you played, how you the sort of how you unlock them and how they work in the game. Sure, yeah, I think this is one of the major editions, if not the major edition, of Black Ops 3. So they're essentially these, these characters. I mean, they affect how you look, but that's minor. But they also, each of them has two abilities. And one is usually a weapon of some sort, um, and the second one's more of a tactical ability, kind okay. of. So you pick, so you pick Ruin, or um, a lot of people have been using um, the Outrider, because mm. you start off with four in the beta, then you can unlock two more at least. Um, but there's Ruin, they're very, they, their superpowers are kind of like destiny abilities, right. so they have, uh, yeah, Ruin, the first one you can use, he has this, um, like, gravity spikes, jumping, ground pound attack. Okay. Titan smash. Titan smash. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 There's the Seraph, which you, is the fifth unlock in the beta, and she has, like, the Hunter's Golden Gun, which is just one-hit kills. Um, that was okay. one of my favorites. It was like a revolver, uh, you know, the, not the highest fire rate, but it was mm. one-hit kill, so if you're accurate enough. Um, and then, you know, the Outrider has the Sparrow Longbow, which is just explosive arrows, but they also have those secondary abilities, which the um, Outrider has this, the Vision Vision sphere, Pulse. Vision Pulse, and it just, for like three seconds, will highlight through walls, anybody in the area, mm. which way they're facing. Uh, it's kind of like what the spectator mode looks like if you're not playing, but... Probably the most interesting one so far, though, is Prophet's Glitch. Yeah, that one's awesome, and Rob got really good at it. Which you pop the ability, and it rewinds your last couple of moves. Okay. So you can run into... We're still trying to, like, wrap our head around this thing, but, like, you can run into a room, drop a grenade, and then teleport backwards out of the room. It sounds like a lot like... Like, I know it's the same company now, but Tracer from Overwatch yeah. does yeah. the same thing, sure. where you're able to, like, backtrack the whole way. Yeah, uh, so at one point when I was using it, I was up kind of this elevated roof. I sprinted down... Someone came around a corner, I used it, and I ended up back on the roof and then sniped them. <laughs> what actually really happened is I missed and someone else killed me, but I like to imagine I sniped them. But, um, and then Rob was around a corner. I was right behind him when we were playing on the same team. Mm. Someone was shooting at him. He used it to go back to where we were, and I kind of killed the person. Sweet. So every once in a while, that creates some pretty awesome, like, holy shit moments. So it worked really well. But, yeah, the specialist class in general, these powers, you know, they have, like, charge times and... There's certain perks that decrease those charge times. Hmm. They really do affect how you build your classes, like what weapons you use, um, how you tailor it to your play style. Hmm. Um, so are you, are you always playing as a specialist? Is that basically what you do when you Yeah, so you in? always have uh, at least one ability active. You, uh, you can only be one specialist at a time, and you can only have one of their hmm. uh, options active. So I right believe the they also longbow. talked about how certain modes even limit the number of certain specialists. Right. Yeah, the giraffe, specialist draft, will it be? Or is yeah. That like a, so yeah, people can... As of now, you can have like four outriders in a match, two ruins. Right. But later on in the certain competitive matches, if you take that ability, no one else can use it. Okay, interesting. Dota style, yeah. picking out your loadout before yeah. uh, before a match. It's uh, it's not in this, but the stream that they did had one of the more interesting mechanics I've seen in a long time, which was the ban protect system. Yeah. Where you can actually vote in that to get rid of something your opponent is using and yeah. protect something that you're using. So, but like Dota is again kind of yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah the banning system. Yeah. That's weird. It's, um, it's, so when you're playing the game, do you at a distance know who you're fighting? Like, can you figure out who the other specialist is sure. by looking at them? Because presumably yeah. knowing what they can do is key to killing them, right? Exactly, yeah. So I don't know if people have noticed a few times during this gameplay, um, the gun will just start, you'll start glowing red. And that means that the Outrider just used their uh, vision pulse ability. Right. So they know exactly where you are. So whenever I saw that, I was like, I'm either about to die, but I'm going to try to make a break for it because they are always going to have the upper hand on me. Mm. Um, when, you know, when Prophet uses Glitch and goes backwards, I kind of look for where they came from to yeah. be expecting them to come through the same doorway <laughs> twice in a row. So it's definitely just as useful to know how other people are going to use it as well as how mm. you're going to offensively use it, which is a cool dynamic um, as far as you know, like considering... Uh, other people's moves as opposed to your own. Mm. So it's really interesting um, as far as those go. Uh, a lot of comparisons, obviously, to games like Titanfall, um, to uh, Destiny as well. Uh, last year with, with Advanced Warfare, we saw a game that was very much like Titanfall in terms of movement and whatnot, perhaps maybe even sort of more futuristic and more variable than Titanfall. Uh, Aaron, how does this one feel? Does it feel more like Advanced Warfare? Does it feel more like a Black Ops game normal? What's the movement like? system in this game is chasing after Titanfall mm. more than Advanced Warfare. Advanced Warfare had, I think what Chris Waters described as very staccato movement. Yeah. It was very jerky. 
Some some people loved it, some people hated it. This one, it's got wall running. It doesn't do wall running as well as Titanfall. Mm. I'm always a big fan of if you're gonna rip somebody off, like do it better than them. <laughs> right, <Jack. laughs> you know, like do it, do do something new or do something better than the last guy. In this case, the wall running feels a little tacked on. There's some very specific routes you can take, mm. but they usually end in dead ends. What is this nonsense happening it's a here? Hellstorm, right? It's a square streak, yeah. It's puts like, his hands out like, like, the, like <laughs> yeah. he's praying or something. I don't know what to do with my hands. Yeah. Future <laughs> yeah. arm laptops. But yeah, I mean. The, the wall running is, it's okay. It's, the routes aren't as good as Titanfall. Titanfall, you were learning, as long as you played Titanfall, you could learn a new route. Yeah. There was always a route you didn't know. This one, a couple rounds on a map, you know the routes. The routes dead end and just drop hmm. you onto the map at certain places. One you know. of the things I really liked about Titanfall was the, the sort of how long your lives were and how, how well, it wasn't just like a, like you say, like a short time to kill. What, what's, uh, this game feel like in comparison to that? Do you have longer lives? Is it more like Call of Duty? The time to kill is marginally longer, so you're actually having gunfights in this game, which I like. Advanced, you know, warfare. I feel like you would just come around a corner, your body would hit the ground before you could even register you'd been hit. Right, yeah. And then you would respawn before, like, you even knew what happened. So it was just this really weird, like, non-gunfight mechanic of mm. whoever shot first. This one, you do actually get into those strafing gunfights. Mm. And if you're both wall running, you have that Titanfall moment <laughs> where you're both like trying to shoot and then one of you makes a mistake and just falls off the cliff. <laughs> yeah. So there's, there's better moments in this one, I think, because of the longer time to kill. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How long's the beta running for? Um, for people who pre-ordered it, it's tomorrow, Wednesday the 19th, I think, until Sunday the 23rd, yeah. whatever Sunday is. All weekend. And you guys have been playing, obviously, for, for sort of like a day and some change. Sure. Uh, Aaron, first of all, what's, what's your take on this, this type of game? Do you, did you play much Advanced Warfare? Is this the type of game that will pull you back into Call of Duty, or is it not scratching that edge? I think it's doing more of what I'd like to see in Call of Duty, which is, again, just actually having gunfights. Mm. But that being said, you know, anytime the camera pulls out and I see the larger map we're playing in, I just want these maps to be bigger. I mean, like, take <laughs> That's the battlefield like, player in you. Take, just... take a chance, just like add a couple more players and make your maps a little bigger because they're small. You, especially in Team Deathmatch, you're always contending with a spawn flip, which always yeah. means there's somebody shooting you in the back. Like, if you're in the middle of the map, I guarantee you're going to get shot in the back because <laughs> somebody's going to spawn behind you. And if they had slightly larger maps, they could probably avoid that. Yeah, maybe a Halo 5 Guardians will scratch that itch for you. Uh, yeah. Mike, what do you feel about it? Um, yeah, I, I like what it's taking from Advanced Warfare in terms of the movement. It definitely feels like a less pared down version of that and more, you know, obviously Black Ops combined with Titanfall, just mm. not doing either to an extreme. Um, I think the Specialist being the major edition is interesting enough to pull me back in, but after you play for about an hour, it still feels like Call of Duty again. Mm. The last eight we've played, um, it's got me hooked. It, I won't lie. And it's so hard to like try and figure out how those systems are working when you're playing like the first two days of an yeah. online shooter because like two weeks down the road, it's like a completely different ball game. Yeah, right? and so the fact that there are so few people playing when we were playing, it was kind of always team deathmatch. Right. So I was looking forward to trying out hardcore mode to see how different weapon loadouts would work mm. and how different abilities would work. Um, and you know, like I don't know that they're bringing Hardpoint back from Advanced Warfare yet, mm. um, but I, I'm just interested to see how those specialist abilities will not only affect how I'm building classes, but how I'll build different classes for different game modes as well. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Mike and Aaron, thanks so much for coming on. Thank uh, you. Talking to us all about the Call of Duties. Uh, Black Ops 3 is out later this year, and the beta is running up until Sunday. Uh, and also, if you're watching right now, you can win yourself a key to the beta. We're giving them away. Hopefully on there to his uh, Josh saw. Sorting me out. For a chance to win, go to tinyurl.com forward slash COD giveaway. Really? No one had COD giveaway? Tiny... That's amazing. Idiots. COD giveaway. Go there right now. You can win a beta code for the Sony PlayStation Gaming System 4. Uh, this is only for US people because uh, we hate Europe. No time for Asia. And I don't think anyone's watching in Africa, so... Uh, no, it's because the keys are American, sorry. Uh, North American. North American or US only? US only. US only. Take that, Canada! Um, <laughs> so if you want in on that, go to tinyurl.com forward slash COD giveaway and uh, do whatever things they ask the, you to do on the page and then you can win. How about that? Cool. Want to go play some Call of Duty, boys? I probably will. Uh, what are you doing for the rest of your week, Aaron Thompson? 
I gotta decide whether I want to stay up really late again and fight Skolas, because last night my team was dropped by his taint around 12.30. His taint? Yeah. How did his taint kill you? We got tainted by Skolas. <laughs> How was it? I you, have to, you have to actually pass his taint. He gives you his taint, and then you have to pass it around. There you go. Yeah. Destiny. Giving, Bungie just giving you the taint. <laughs> I guess you spent $100 on a game and it should probably give you the taint. At, the very, I, least, yeah. at the very least. Uh, That's why I play Destiny. You sounded super frustrated this morning. <laughs> like you did four hours of it and there was like no save point or something. Yeah, there's no save point and the reset happened anyway. So great. Was, yep. So you get to fight for an hour for a chance <laughs> to try and fight for another three or four hours. <laughs> great. So then I can become legend. How do you do this and have children? This is incredible. You're like a you're like an oddity to me. It's amazing. It's not easy and uh, my wife doesn't really accept an explanation <laughs> like, oh sorry honey, I came home at 12.30 because of Skolas's taint. <laughs> do the whole wake up at 2 a.m. and then play until 6 a.m. and no one will know the difference. <laughs> uh, Mike, what are you up to for the rest of the week? Uh, I will probably play... Embargoed or Block no? Ops, as well as it's something coming out next week. I don't know if it's embargoed, but okay. um, I should probably know that. But a lot of um, embargoed games happening in the office at the moment. It's yeah, fucking annoying. And then Volume, new stealth game. That's not embargoed. Just came out. Nope, just Mike, came out today. Mike Bithel's game. Yep. Oh, it's out, so it's not embargoed. Yeah. It's okay. Good. We're good. It's a good game. Awesome. Is it good? Is a review up? Yep. Is it? I wrote it. What was what score did you give it? I gave it an eight. An eight out of ten. Eight spot. We're back. Thanks for watching, guys. <laughs> See you next week. <laughs>